Greetings. Welcome back. I hope that you are enjoying this short series of very short public speaking advice videos here on our beautiful St. John's University campus. Welcome. If you're ever in uh, the New York, Queens area, come visit. Take a campus tour. I mean, you can't do it right now, pandemic and everything. Hopefully, we'll be able to look at this video in a year or so and kind of be like, wow, I'm sure I'm glad we don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, here's to hoping. But uh, this video is about style and speech. And uh, it's going to be very quick because the trick to having good public speaking style is simply to realize that when you are talking to an audience on video like this or in person, audiences want to see the expression of emotion and caring. Now, your first reaction to that is probably going to be, well, no, they don't. All we ever hear about when we think about politics and political speech is facts. We say, give us the facts, tell us the truth, don't lie, tell us what's true, tell us what's factual, all that. And so we, we mistakenly get the idea that what we should hear in a speech is facts, and so we should just be hearing a report. But that eliminates the most powerful advantage you have when you're speaking to an audience, and that is your voice, your feelings, your mind, and your identity, which one pours into a speech to make it good. Think about the TED Talks as a good example of this. Now, in TED Talks, you can go and read about any of that research and get the exact same information. Why do you want to watch the TED Talks then? Wouldn't it save you time? TED Talk is 15, sometimes 20 minutes long. Sometimes they're quite long. Sometimes they're, usually they're supposed to be 8 to 10, right? Isn't that the rule for the TED Talks, under 15 minutes or 12 minutes? Uh, some researchers have done it once and said they'll never do it again. They didn't like the format. Others tend to think it was a wonderful way to share their research with the world. Now, what's the difference between going and reading a summary in a, in a journal or a newspaper account or some other writing of someone's great research and hearing them speak about it? What is it for you? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that we like to see someone who cares about what they're talking about speaking to us about it. Now, most of the speeches that I've been looking at this term are very soulless. They're you reading a report to us. LeBron James is the most famous and best basketball player of all time. Some of you may disagree, but LeBron James has the record and the talent and skills to show you that, uh, sorry, to, I'm sorry, I think he has the talent and skills. Nobody wants to hear that. What you're doing is you're making the information more boring more terrible, less interesting. And let's be honest, no matter how you feel about LeBron James, the dude is really interesting and has lived a fantastic life that should cultivate excitement and interest in you if you're talking about it. This is an inspirational figure with what he's done. So what are some of the problems here with style? What are the, some of the things that are keeping us away from it? And I think, again, it's the prevalence of bad ideas about communication and bad ideas about what a good presentation is that probably come from the media and, yes, of course, the bad teachers you've had before. Uh, I always love to drag bad high school teachers uh, and bad university teachers. There's plenty of them. I mean, not, not anywhere here. I mean, maybe over there. No, no. There's Sometimes they're hanging out in these trees out here just kind of looking around for like a little scrap or something, but uh, I don't see any today. But anyway, let's go to the uh, board here, and we'll talk about some tips about style. Now, I put these up here as headings to keep my to keep myself on track, and that's actually kind of the first hidden lesson, is you see that when I speak to you, I don't use an uh, any kind of written essay. Why? Because my fidelity is to you, not to what I want to say. The important part of every speech is connection because connection leads to communication, which leads to understanding, which then leads to sympathy, which then leads to persuasion, agreement, or some movement towards what you want them to do. That's the essential part of oratory. There's absolutely no reason why what you've written out must be perfectly read to us. What you wrote is for you to wrap your head around the speech. You wrote that for you. That was to help you 
get a sense of things. Not for us. So that's our first point is use an outline. Don't read. When you read, you're worried about getting right what you wrote on the paper. And if you don't get it right, you're going to go back and say, oh, I'm sorry. You're going to stumble. You're going to try to get what you wrote perfectly out there. But when you write and you're reading it, you're worried about getting the page right. The relationship between you and the piece of paper, not the important relationship, which is right here. Your eye contact is gone. Your attention to detail is gone. Your speed is too fast for understanding. You don't use the important punctuation. Your paper, I mean, this is a bad example. These are my notes. But your paper that you wrote, I bet it's perfectly grammatically correct and perfectly punctuated. That punctuation and those conventions are for the human eye, not the human ear. When we speak, we have a different kind of punctuation. We have pauses. We have gaps between words. And then we have weird things we can do with our voice, such as stretching out words to give them emphasis or shortening words that should be extremely long. Extremely long and complicated phrases can be made very quickly and very short to prove a point. Now, that kind of verbal punctuation you can't do if you're connected to a piece of paper. Ditch the script. Ditch it. Use an outline like this. This is all this is an outline, folks. There's no Roman numerals here. Down with the Romans. Pfft, we don't need them anymore. We're done with them. I mean, maybe Latin is cool, I guess, if you're interested in law or sounding really cool at parties or something, but you don't need Roman numerals. You don't need some kind of formal outline. All you need is an outline to help you remember what you want to say. That is the function of an outline. You've got it in your head. You kind of know what you want to say. An outline helps you organize a little bit too, but don't read a paper to us. Don't read an essay. The outline gives you this kind of connection. It makes you so much more powerful. Ooh, this should be centered, right? That's my outline title. Secondly, in fidelity to the audience, chat with them. Okay, why are all these things bold? Does anybody know why this happens? I don't want I don't want bold text right now. Is it because I made this bold? I didn't hit a carriage return or something? Okay, anyway. Chat with them. Be conversational. Kind of like what I'm doing now. I'm talking to you the way I would if I was talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not reading at a rapid rate a whole bunch of information I want you to get. I'm pausing. I'm letting things sink, sink in. Now, I have talked about style and speaking for years. I've been a teacher for a long time. This is not new information to me. And if I'm not careful, I could speed through it and lose you at some point. Because this information is so familiar to me, it's hard to remember when and how I learned it. Like it's that long ago. And for a lot of you, you're experts in lots of things. This is basketball, fashion, uh, the Kardashians. Um, you're experts in lots of stuff that the audience might not be so familiar with. So you have to be careful. You have to be very, very, very careful that you are not going too fast. You're not leaving out parts for them to digest it. Right? Think about a restaurant. They don't keep bringing you plates of food and taking them away unless it's a comedy skit. They let you sit and eat, and they ask you if you're finished. They look for feedback. They look for signs that you have done, you've cleared that course, you're done with that plate. Be conversational, chat with them. It's the same kind of politeness, the same kind of thing. Fidelity to the audience, not to the text. Don't worry about mistakes. <clears throat> if you make a mistake and leave something out, don't tell us. Just add it in at the next important uh, moment or the next, uh, I shouldn't say important moment, the next moment where it makes sense to add it back in. Do that, okay? Don't worry about mistakes. You're trying to create a connection here. It doesn't really matter how it goes. As long as people have multiple ways of getting their way in, then things are going to be fine. You want to give them handholds, pathways, um, sidewalks, um, uh, nature trails, whatever the metaphor you want to give them ways into what you're saying. Fidelity to the audience. Okay, you have to use tone, pauses, intensity, and emotion. I don't know where we got this idea that emotion is bad. Humans are emotional. That is how we are. Why do we keep wanting to purge that from our public discourse? 
Why are we obsessed with facts? Let's be obsessed with people and be obsessed with everyone's thought and exposure and their perception and their attention to what's going on in the world is valuable. That value can only be communicated by sharing the passion you feel for whatever it is that you're sharing. You know, oh, you know, I, I don't know about this political issue, but let me tell you about this time in the park where I saw somebody behaving in this crazy way, and it really got me thinking about this issue. That's how minds are changed. That's how people are opened up to the world around them. That's how politics happens, folks. Not because you went and got some uh, fact from the third hit down on Google 20 minutes before the assignments do. That is not how minds are changed. They're changed by emotional connection between people when you communicate the most basic and essential foundational thing every speech has, which is the argument, I care. I care. How do you communicate caring? Do you have a guess? I mean, there's so many ways to do it. I mean, I do it through eye contact, a certain kind of passion, intensity, gesturing, um, trying to be uh, easy to listen to, exciting to listen to. I work to make this engaging and thoughtful for you. You should do the same for your audience. It's a gesture of respect, but it's also the primary ingredient in what you're making here is that fundamental argument. I care. I care about this issue. I care about you. And I care about your understanding of this issue. Think about that. It's very important. So this is a good transition to the next thing. I talk about care and interest. Care and interest. Tone. So many of you are talking about something extremely sad or extremely exciting, and you sound like the most boring person in the world, just reading it to us. It was one of the best moments of my life, and I will never forget it. I was so terrified. I thought I was going to die. It was a horrible moment, and I will never forget it. It has burned itself into my mem excuse me, my memory forever. Okay, this isn't, first of all, you're obviously lying. Is that the way somebody sounds who cares or is motivated or impacted by an event? I mean, this is a bad liar, is what you sound like. Don't do that. Emotional moments require parity with your tone. Duh. If you're sad, sound sad. If you're happy, sound happy. If you're thoughtful and you're speculating, sound speculative. Sound like you have some wonder or some interest. You know, I've been thinking, you know, I was going to do this speech on this, but what I've really been thinking about is the experiences we all have when we're growing up. Now, somebody really did this speech in my class for the last one. I thought it was a great topic because it could go anywhere. And I was so interested and plugged in but if the care and interest level of the language the tone and the performance of that tone had been more intense that speech would have been just dynamite it fell short of that right so you have to think about how do we get that parity you know i'm very concerned about this election i feel like Things are going to be really bad if we don't make the right choice. But I'm not talking about candidates here. Mm -mm. I'm talking about the choice of whether or not we vote. And it is a dark, dark, dark time in this country when less than half of eligible voters decide that it's worth their time to say who they think should lead this country and lead the world. So let's face it. That's what the president does. You can argue that, but seems like that happens more often than not. Okay, so that's just an example of how to do that emotional language that we need on that. What about interest? How do we convey this idea, I'm interested in you? Now, this is very important for audiences to get that feeling, right? That's an important thing for audiences to get. I'm interested in you. How do we communicate that? How do we communicate to an audience that we're interested in them? Eye contact. Eye contact. <clears throat> it's hard to do uh, when you're doing internet speeches. It's the camera lens, not the screen, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, not the keyboard. Not, uh, you know, your roommate down the hall. 
Hello. Nothing like that. It's, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Eye contact is connected to sincerity. Um, speed. Are you trying to get through your speech and get done? Or are you trying to reach people in a way they can understand it and recall it? Pauses, reflection, and indication of thought. These are incredibly important. Even if you don't need a reference, let me check this. Sometimes it is very good to pretend that you need one. It's right there. Now that is what we call performing the evidence, right? Now that wasn't written on there, but you can see what that performance does. Let me read that to you again. Sometimes, even if you don't need to check your notes, it is a great way to make an interesting and a very well-connected moment of sincerity for the audience. It's right there even if you don't need the notes. I'm proving that I'm thinking and I'm referring to things. Very famous moment in the Checker speech, Richard Nixon did that, where he said, and I'm going to read directly from this letter that I got from these accountants today, and he held up the paper and read it, but you could tell he already knew what he wanted to say because he didn't really keep his eyes on the paper. He knew already, but he also knew the power of holding up the letter. I have it right here. It's a wonderful performative way to show the audience, hey, I'm interested in you, and I'm very interested <clears throat> and what you think about me and where you think I'm getting information from and who you think I am and what I'm drawing on when I make these claims. Transitions. This is a big one. And uh, this is actually related to something else I want to talk about in terms of uh, care and interest, which could be its own thing, but might be its own, uh, its own uh, I don't know, sub-lecture that I do. Organization. Um... Backing off and backing up. Um, what what would you say this is sort of like moving up in a way? I might do this in a little bit uh, more detail. Maybe I should do another lecture just on organization. But instead of something like, um, I think Jordan is a great basketball player as a topic, Think about how I can back off of this and back up from it and kind of go to the higher ground, the higher view of it, and make my thesis, what makes a basketball player great? Because that's a much more interesting way to bring the audience in. What if they already have a lot of preconceptions about who the best basketball player is? Those preconceptions are placed into the spotlight of interrogation, not when you go ahead and cut them out and say Jordan's the one. People are not really going to listen to you very critically and they're not going to open their minds to you. But if you say, what makes a basketball player great? The organization automatically comes to the standards. How would we evaluate a claim like that? And those become the standards by which the speech is organized around. So that's another good thing to think about. And I'm going to do an organization one. I've already decided it's too important to just leave it to that. I'm doing an organization video as well. Okay. Transitions. When we're moving between the subpoints and the things that we're talking about in our speeches, we have to have transitional phrases, which indicate that we are moving to a new point of consideration and why we are moving to that particular new point. Bold again. I hate bold. Get rid of that. Bold's just for it headings people that's what a transition is so some examples of transitions are things like yeah really now that we have investigated discussed or considered x we can ask the question we can oh well that's more advanced we can move to understanding why? Okay, so that's like a simple one. But another way of doing transitions is using questions. Now that we have answered why, you might be wondering how we can incorporate this into our daily lives. 
Okay, so that's another good transition there too. The whole purpose of a transition is not to just drop a sub point and move on to the next one, but to let the audience know why you're going to that particular point next. And one of the best ways is to assume what their questions are about your topic and move naturally between the questions they might have about whatever subject that you are uh, handling with. Pausing and asking questions. This is very advanced. It also might make you feel awkward since you're just talking to a camera, but taking a minute to let the audience really think about what it is you're saying is essential. It's not so bad. I do it all the time in these videos. Asking the audience a question is better than telling them. Bad, here's bold again, good Lord. One day I'll fix this. Bad speeches tell the audience what is right or good or what they should do. Good speeches show the audience. All right, now what does that mean? Good speeches show them. You ask them questions, you put them in the scene. Don't just tell them, well, you know, I got this really interesting job and uh, I had to make a lot of tough decisions there. Put them in there, show them that that's important. Say, you know, I was in this situation and my boss was saying this, but I knew that the product was bad. What do I do? How do I make that decision? If I know one of my friends is stealing from the company, what should I do? What would you do if you were me? How do I bring this up with management? Are they going to accuse me of being in on it if he gets caught? Things like that. That shows the audience how important and how central that is to what you're doing. So instead of telling them why a particular player, a particular musician is great, Show them, bring up those questions, ask those things. That's what you need to be doing, right? So I think I think that's all for, for style. But uh, all these things, let me zoom out here so you can get the uh, full look of everything. Fidelity of the audience, not your piece of paper, not what you wrote. Care and interest, I'm interested in you. How do you do that? How do you show interest and care to an audience? Transition, pausing, asking questions, all essential things, all incredibly important things that you need to do in order to make sure that the audience is there to build that relationship with you. Style is essential. You have to show emotion. You can't just be a fact machine lifting off, uh, just reading from a piece of paper. Nobody's going to watch it. If your speech could be emailed and be read in five minutes, then there's no point for you to give it. Why are you reading a two-page document to us? Perform it. Embody it. Show us the passion and care. Use your voice and your presence to really get the audience in there. It's such a great advantage over text that we have in oratory is that physical presence, the face, the eye contact, the tone of voice, the way it sounds. It conveys emotion, passion, and connection, and it's a wonderful tool and an essential one to use in oratory in order to get the audience on your side.